Greetings, you wonderful warriors of the Broken Sword, you. I'm Jonathan. I'm Nick. And we are the Goslings, a digital speakeasy of free thinkers, Christian authors, general purveyors of buffoonery extraordinaire. Amen. <laughs> a very dark lit digital speakeasy. Yes, very dark lit. And we're going to do our toast, as we always do. You guys know the drill. Fill your drinking vessels with orange soda. Or coffee. Or coffee, whatever you want to fill them with. Put a six pack of beer soda in here. <laughs> yeah. And I believe I leave this time. Yeah, it's your turn. All right, here we go. Take up the broken sword of your father. And strike down the darkness. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. How's that orange soda? Uh, summary. Summary? Yeah. yeah. So it tastes like a melted uh, orange cream popsicle in my Kothon Spartan <laughs> mug, which we'll talk about here in a second. Nice. Uh, all, if you guys are watching for the first time, never been to the channel before, uh, we'd love it if you'd subscribe. Take up the broken sword of your finger and strike down the subscribe button. That's right. Also, abuse that bell. Yes, hit that bell. Strike that bell. Hit it like it owes you money. Keep your YouTube pimp hand strong. Wayne Brady that bell. <laughs> Is Wayne Brady going to have to smack a bell? <laughs> rear end that bell as if just rear end it like in traffic. I like hit it hard. <laughs> yeah. 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 Do uh, what's what's the guy's name? Hawk. Oh, yeah, uh, from uh, Over the Top. Over the Top, yeah. Yeah. Go over the top, arm wrestle that bell, smack Yeah, it. thumb. Oh, yeah, that was a cool right move. Over. Yeah. And just wham. <laughs> and if you've already done those horrible things to that bell. Yeah, turn that bell into Liberty Bell Part 2. Yeah, <laughs> you could also like the video. That's something you can do if you've already subscribed. We'd really appreciate it. Yeah. Hit the like button. Just do it now. It costs you nothing. Yeah. It takes zero time and effort hit the like button we'd really really appreciate that it would Absolutely. do wonders for us even though it it's like does, it practically takes nothing on your end but it makes a world of difference uh for this video and the interview that we're about to play for you uh but before we jump into that let us acknowledge our sponsors yeah uh the beautiful handcrafted hand-painted mug that i'm drinking my summery orange soda out of is the Kothon Spartan mug. Uh, this is handcrafted and handmade by Joel Cherico from Cherico Pottery and his team up at CherikoPottery.com. You should check it out. They're beautiful. This is a replica of what the Spartans drank out of. It's called a Kothon. And he designed these in collaboration with our great mentor. Yeah. yeah. And friend and uncle, yeah. so to speak. Uncle Favorite Stephen uncle. Pressfield. Uncle Steve. Uncle Steve. He's great. Yeah. Adopted uncle. <laughs> adoptive uncle yeah, yeah he, probably a lot right. of people adopted him as their uncle and you know what uh i don't think these are probably available anymore you might be able to find some of them on i think it's damn fine books and mugs.com uh, okay which is uh sort of an auction website okay. that he has in collaboration with steven press oh okay but joel cherico makes a ton of amazing pottery projects or uh, uh products at CherikoPottery.com. So if you're looking for these, you probably need to go to damnfinebooksandmugs.com or you uh, want, if you want other stuff, then you need to go to CherikoPottery.com. So it's yep. nice to see them branching out and nice to see him sort of teaming up with Steve. And really Absolutely. So. Absolutely. And then after you are done drinking your libation from your holy Laconian vessel, you can then take care of your hirsute manly pate of facial <laughs> hair with Giordani Jovanovic. <laughs> Hair and skincare products. Hair and skincare products made by real men for real men. Or as I like to say, be as sexy as you are deadly. Give 007 a run for his money. Awaken your inner John Wick with Jardani Jovanovic. That's right. Com. Brought to you by our wonderful sponsor, Mike Fisher. Yeah. Who's in the chat that. tonight? I see yeah. Mike If you Fisher have any there. questions about awesome skin and hair care products for men, go ahead and put them in the chat and talk to Mike Fisher because he's the owner. And he's there. You know, I just ran out of uh, the F1 oh yeah formula the dude, oil it's coming in nice yeah it's just working yeah yeah, yeah. dude proof's in the pudding <laughs> that's you right know? uh but i need to get some more of that the, the uh, favors in the follicle that's <laughs> uh i see also joining us tonight uh jay reese chris caps yep andy uh, goss our and great cousin cousin andy what's up cousin andy in rome georgia yeah glad he's watching tonight that's cool mm -hmm. very cool uh connor hatcher 
Oh, uh, Connor, what's up, buddy? Quick 66, hello. Yeah. Vinny Boomba's in the house. Vinny what? Boomba. Oh, yeah. and we got a super chat from Mike Fisher. Nice. How Thanks, about Mike. that? Thank you. That is very generous. Strike down the darkness with the Goss Bros. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Thank you that's so very much. Sweet of you. Man, that is awesome. Super chats. Yes. That's awesome. We accept super chats, super thanks, uh, gold, teeth, especially gold teeth. <laughs> you know, I'm going to take my half of that super chat and buy some more F1 formula. There you go. Yeah. Because yeah. uh-huh. I need some. Yeah. Um, <laughs> very cool. Let me get this. I'm having trouble getting this caption down. There we go. All right. Uh, we have a fantastic interview. Yeah. We got to speak with Michael. I'm going to go for it. Ready? I'm, we got to speak with Michael. Galliardi. Nice. Galliardi. I've been working Galliardi. on it all. I butchered it in the interview. Uh, but uh, Galliardi. And uh, let's all say it together, chat. Galliardi. 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 He's a phenomenal Christian man. Uh, but this interview is really cool. But imagine what it'd be like. So we all know, like, the movie Exorcist. Maybe a lot of you have seen Nefarious. And there's this Hollywood representation of, like, what demon possession looks like. But imagine you're seven years old and your mother that you live with mm-hmm. is demon possessed and it doesn't stop for 11 years yeah. and you live under a reign of terror. Yeah. That is Michael's story. Yeah, and a that's a survivor. And he's a survivor of this mm-hmm. miraculous that he survived this at all. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you, that's, that is the story that you're going to hear tonight. Yeah. And he has some books that are available. Um, telling that story, devil take the hindmost, uh, parts one and two. Yep. And then uh, he has a children's book or a book about stories from his childhood uh, called uh, Being a Kid is Great Work if You Can Find It. Yeah, it's there. great work if you can get it. It's great work if you yeah. can get it. And you can find those books on Amazon. But the funny thing is, like, uh, really, he spends most of his time playing flamenco music. Yeah, he is a very talented flamenco guitarist and musician. Yeah. And uh, that's that's how he makes his living. And he doesn't have a website. He doesn't like he doesn't like self promote or anything. He's just kind of out there living his life. Yep. You know, it's really cool. Yeah. Well, you go through something like that, and it has it leaves a mark on you. Yeah. And you're a little more reticent to put yourself self out there and do a lot of socialization. Right. You know, I mean, it comes with some baggage. Yeah. Uh, as you guys will see in the interview. Uh, but uh, I got it queued up. I'm ready to play it. Yeah. Uh, thank you guys. Also, uh, wanted to, who else? I saw someone else in the show. Oh, Kina Menard is watching. Kathy Marcello is watching. Yes, Kathy. Guys, Kathy. thank you. So glad you joined us tonight. Yeah, absolutely. that's awesome. We'll be in the chat uh, as we play part one of the interview, and uh, we'll come back uh, live in about 42 minutes yeah. and uh, queue up part two. 42 minutes that is uh that is the answer to the universe and everything that's right hitchhiker's guide to the uh galaxy we are writers at the end of the day that's right that's right well let me turn the music down yep tee up the interview and uh without further ado here is our interview with michael galliardi part one part one galliardi vertical punch your youtube feed is crap Stop wasting your time watching bot-boosted shills and self-appointed gurus cloying for your attention. Instead, join the Goslings interview, live stream, and podcast. The Goslings, a dark-lit digital speakeasy of free thinkers. A super chat of radical truth-seeking wizards who eat trolls for second breakfast. Topics that'll make your mama's hair stand on end. Ideas that'll make your pastor's knees knock. Guests that will illuminate the hidden chambers of your mind. And interviews that strike down the darkness. Welcome to the Goslings. So, you are, um, you're actually a talented musician. Uh, flamenco yeah. guitarist. Yeah, jazz and flamenco, yeah. Jazz wow. and flamenco, That's fantastic. That's so cool. Uh, you have an amazing story. You do. You produce a lot of music. A lot of your music can be found on YouTube. Uh, I didn't know that. But you have such an interesting uh, background. Uh, you grew up. Uh, your childhood was plagued with a mother who was demon possessed. Can you tell us a little bit about that? T- tell us that story about what was your childhood like 
when did this come into your awareness? How did you live with that for so long? Well, um, okay, I'll, I'll start from before I was born because it helps set the kind of set the background for it. Um, before I was born, my mother, who's the eldest of three, her father died in a tragic accident. I, I, what I'm told is he was drinking, um, went across railroad tracks, and the train cut his legs off and killed him. I don't know if he did it on purpose. Wow. But, you know, where we lived in Canada in those days, trains went right through your backyard. There were no fences, no nothing. You just, you know, have common sense. Don't stand in front of the train. <laughs> you know? Wow. Yeah. But, wow. Uh, my mother adored my grandfather or her father. And yeah. my, I have an older sister who's seven years older than me. And she told me that my mother was like just a wreck because she adored her father. So fast forwarding a little bit before, still before I was born, um, my aunt, who's my mother's younger sister, uh, she was involved in occultism in the, in the probably late 60s early 70s by the time i was born by the time i was uh two years old three years old probably three three and a half i remember her coming over and i remember you know listening from the room because as all kids do you know you're listening to the adults yeah. talking out there at the kitchen yeah. table and they're mm -hmm. talking about seances and stuff like this and i didn't even know what the world word meant until 20 years later and then kind of put it all together but uh my <sighs> my mother's sister was into the occult she i believe and my mother did a seance because you know in the early 70s that was the hip thing everybody was doing seances you know that was even more than ouija board stuff ouija board was like 70s you know but this was like early 70s and i think my mother was so heartbroken that she lost her father at such a young age, because my mother was just a teenager. I think that she tried to, in any way, shape, or form she could, to try and contact, to have some sort of connection with her father. Um, this is what my sister t tells me, you know, before I was born. And when I was born, as I was about two or three years old, I would hear them talk about these things, seances and stuff. And then we got, just kind of put it together. Um, even as, an, as, as a child, my mother never held me she never kissed me she never ruffled my hair you know good boy and anything like that she paid no attention to me whatsoever by the time i was three and a half we were living in toronto and this is the episode that got me <gasps> okay something's not right i was probably three and a half and you know as an italian family we eat pasta fasule you know, it's a little like star soup for American kids, you know. Yeah. And, uh, I, you know, I come to the table, it would already be there. But this one time I came to the table and it wasn't there. And she came up behind me and she dumped the whole pot down my shoulder. Golly. So scalding hot soup all down my so shoulder. Wow. Um, I was screaming my head off. She called the taxi. A taxi came. While we were in the taxi, she never comforted me. She never held me. She never said anything to me. We just went to the doctor. I remember sitting in the waiting room. I don't remember the doctor's visit, but I remember sitting in the waiting room. Never said a word to me. Um, we did the doctor's visit. On the way home, never said a word. And uh, we went home. And I don't even know what happened after that. I don't remember whether my dad said, well, you know, what, what happened? You know, I don't remember. But that's where I started to look at my mom like, oh, you're not safe. Mm. And as a child, if you read my book, even as a three-year-old, I was extremely analytical and awake. I was noticing everything from that point on. She made me awake. So I watched her with, with great observance and I think we lasted about a, a year, maybe six months later, we moved into a house. When we moved into the house, I think I was almost four because I remember going to preschool. And then she began saying, not to me, of course, but I'm overhearing, you know, and my sister backed this up because she told me. She said, um, my mother would say that she was hearing voices. 
and hearing scratching and thumping in the walls and this kind of stuff and seeing little people running around the house and this kind of stuff. Mm. So here now we go. If you've ever done um, an analysis on exorcism and uh, on people that are demonically possessed, and I'm not talking about people on YouTube. I'm talking about cases that were, oh, my God, we had, you know, 30 people that witnessed this. You know, you will notice that all possessions start out the same. They start out mm -hmm. with some breakdown in a person's life. Yeah. Then mm -hmm. it goes to it goes mm -hmm. to some sort of reaching out to some demonic entity unawares. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's when you give invitation because the Lord told us, you know, necromancy necromancy is punishable by death yeah. so did he say that because it doesn't happen no he said that because it does happen yeah. <laughs> and it is possible <laughs> and it does work yeah. and that's the problem that's why he said it's punishable by death you know and saul did it of course so my mother started to get increasingly um, the word isn't paranoid she became even more distant she started off like very I'm, I'm going to say trance-like because she never paid any attention to me, but she wasn't violent. She wasn't, she was just not there, yeah. you know? And by the time we moved up to this place, which I don't know why we moved up to this place, but it was definitely demonic. We moved away from our family, moved 120 miles away to this isolated little tiny town in Meaford, Ontario, Canada, on the lake with 4,300 people. And we move up there, and now we're away from everybody. We're away from her brother, her sister, my dad's, all of my dad's family. And my dad has to drive all the way back down to Toronto and stay down there during the week to go to work. So this is another thing that the enemy the enemy loves to do, is he, he isolates your victim. Mm -hmm. You'll see this with the uh, demon of Gennesaret. He's running around in the tombs. He's completely isolated from the society. You know, th this is this is part of the agenda that they use, you know. So here we are. We're up in this little town called Meaford. And I I start to go to kindergarten. And my mom starts getting pro progressively worse. She's starting to hear voices all the time. She's not connecting with us. She's talking to herself now a lot. I mean, so much so that, uh, hello. I'm right here and doesn't even acknowledge that we're there. Mm. And this goes on for a number of years. So I don't know any better. I This is all I've known all my life and pretty much my sister all her life too. So we thought she, she was just crazy. We just thought, oh, mom's crazy. You know, mm. whatever. I mean, I didn't know any better. I mean, I was just a kid and this had been going on since I was little. So we start to get in around, um, I'm nine years old, 10 years old. Now my mother's starting to do bizarre things. Mm. She tries to kill the cat. She wants to hang the cat. She's going around knocking on doors, all of our neighbors, and telling the neighbors in a weird voice, I'm going to cut your head off when they answer the door. Whoa. Of course, that draws a little response. Yeah, a little so, bit. So people start calling the cops. The cops start coming over to, to our house and interviewing you know me my sister you know my sister's much older she's like i said she's seven years old or so she's like 15 years old 16 years old and by this time my sister was living in her room with a padlock on her door in the inside of her door wow i grew up with my sister but i didn't see her yeah. she'd come out grab food pew, back in the room lock the door because mom started to get scary and this yeah. is where things started to fall apart. One afternoon, I was called, I was at school, and there was a knock on the schoolroom door. There was a policeman and some other, you know, sooty looking people standing there. And uh, they talked to the, the teacher and they called my name and they said, could you, could you come here? So I went out into the hallway. They said, um, you're gonna go with Jerry, who was my next door neighbor. That he's going to take you home oh. and i'm like okay so i get in the car and he's taking me home and he says michael he says something happened and he said your mother tried to kill your sister with a butcher knife 
Mm. And, and I said, oh, okay. Didn't shock me at all. Didn't shock me at all. Once I got home, when I got home, um, my sister was there. Uh, my mother had already been taken away in a straitjacket. She'd all been, already been taken away. Wow. I told my sister, I asked my sister, what happened? She said, mom came fla flying out of the kitchen with the, our big butcher knife, screaming, you're a witch, you're a witch, and I'm going to kill you. But because I was lazy that day, and you know we're in Canada, but it was a warm day that day, I left the mudroom door open, and I left the outside door open, and I left the outside screen door open. So my sister was able to run out all three doors without getting stabbed, because she said she was right behind her. And she chased her around the car, and that's where the neighbors came out, saw this, and then called the police. Wow. So, so my my sister's like completely traumatized by this. I'm like, I'm not traumatized by it at this point because I don't even know what trauma is, and I'm already traumatized by all the years of all the craziness going on. But I had no idea it was going to get ten times worse. Um, three months later, our father tells us she's coming back. They could find nothing wrong with her at the mental institution, so she's coming back. Now, mm -hmm. how do you bring a witnessed killer who is trying to kill her children back into the house with minors? I have no idea, but this is exactly what happened. So she comes back. The first day she comes back, she's worse than when she left. And now I'm putting it all together. I'm, you know, years later, I put it all together. Ah. You kick out the demons or whatever. You see that your house, the house is clean. You wander, you come back, you bring seven more worse. And yeah. this is exactly what happened. She yeah. started to get worse. And now things changed. She began to speak in all kinds of different languages. I had no clue what she was saying. Frustrated the hell out of me. And she began to have these conversations back and forth, arguing with one voice to another voice, one voice to another voice, one voice to another voice, and then laugh <laughs> out loud extremely, and then go into uh, whistling hymns and all kinds of stuff like that. Hmm. Now, I did some research on the Ronald Doe case, which is not his name, and one of the things that the demons did, this, this was a case that was definitely, there was something going on, that Ronald, who was a kid at that time, would would whistle in pitch perfect whistling hymns and songs he never knew hmm. so my mother would turn the pbs channel on which was all music and sing at the top of her lungs to every song to every song pitch perfect and whistling and i'm like wow she's got it she's got a pretty amazing voice i used to think to myself wow and she can whistle like very very clear and precise and she wow. had no she had no pitch problems you know and i was like wow so my sister at that point when she came back she couldn't handle it anymore she was old enough she was 18 by that time she left yeah. she told me later on that she felt so bad leaving me alone because now i'm alone yeah okay now i'm alone and i just start eking out the next few months to a year trying to survive alone with this woman and it starts to get worse. So now when the sun goes down, she goes in her bedroom and you know, in Canada we have subfloors, right? Cause we have a basement. So if you pound on the subfloor, you can hear it all throughout the house, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was just a small house, 1300 square feet. You know, her, her bedroom was like four steps from the living room. You just go around the corner and down the hall, four steps and there you are. I'm hearing all this banging going on, like people wrestling. I'm hearing it, the ceiling. I'm hearing the floor. I'm hearing the walls. Bang, 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 bang. I run over there, open the door, and my mother's lying there in bed with the blankets pulled up to her eyes, and her eyes are like this, like saucers. Wow. And this happened 
all the time. It kept going on and I'd run into the room and she'd just be lying there. Now, mind you, at this time, my mother was morbidly obese. Okay. And yeah. she was eating everything in sight like a ravaging animal. Really? So much so that my dad had to take all of our food, put it in the freezer downstairs, and put a big chain and padlock on it. Wow. So, wow. And this is where things started to get worse after my sister left. When my sister left, she started doing these arguments in different voices and, and uh, you know, you know, and, and growling and getting, you know, and fighting and fighting with herself and, and then laughing out loud in a split second, just laughing out loud. Then she started taking a log and hitting herself in the chest. And she would do this from sun up to sundown until she was bloody. And wow. there were days where I couldn't stand it in the summer that I would go and I would sleep in the park because I didn't want to go home. And then when I'd come home, I would come home with my bike and I would go park my bike outside and I could hear the thumping from outside, her hitting herself in the chest. And I would Jeez. open the door and there she was. <laughs> And whacking herself with this with this log, and then mm. and then start singing ooh, like this, and then drop deading her leg. Boom! She lift up her leg. Boom! Boom! And I couldn't take this anymore. And I thought to myself, you know, my sister's gone. And I thought, I thought to myself, I'm going to have to kill her, or she's going to kill me, mm -hmm. because. She now is becoming unpredictable and it was scaring me to death because for a number of years up until that time, I was already sleeping with my armoire pushed against my door and I laid in bricks, stacks of bricks in all the drawers. I took all my clothes out and I put bricks in there and then I slept with my hockey stick and I slept in the same fetal position all night long for so many years that the springs popped out where my knee, my shoulder, my hip, and my ankle were because I stayed in the same position. Mm -hmm. And of course there was no food. So for years I had been stealing food out of gardens. Oh, you know, like in Canada, everybody has a huge garden. I was mm -hmm. eating raw vegetables during the summer. And then in the winter time, I was stealing kids' lunches at school and they never caught me. <laughs> yeah. It's the reason why I'm a vegetarian to this day. Oh, really? <laughs> really? <laughs> I was forced to eat raw vegetables. I mean, I would, I would grab a lettuce, take it down to the creek, wash it off in the water, and just eat it like an apple. So if you ever come to the States and you come to Nashville, Tennessee, you're saying I can't buy you a steak, Michael? No, I'm still I'm still a vegetarian. <laughs> I'll buy you a salad. All right. <laughs> yeah. I, I got a question for you during this time, and forgive me if you already covered it. Um, so your sister... Uh, your sister sounds amazing, by the way. Your sister sounds like she really cares about you. And yeah, she did, but we don't have a relationship. Oh, I'm sorry, man. Uh, yeah. Uh, I apologize. Um, oh, no problem. So she felt bad for leaving you alone. Um, yes. And, you know, there was no food in the house because your mom was eating it all the time. Uh, where was your father during this time? Was he working a lot? Was he traveling for work or... Okay. He was working 120 miles away and he was sleeping in his truck. He made a bed in his truck. Right. So he would go down there, work five or six days a week and then come up for one day or so and then go, take off back again. So he what was about, absentee. Yeah. Okay. Um, what about the neighbors? Did the neighbors ever get involved in anything? I mean, did they hear the pounding? Did they give you food? I mean, if I, some, if I saw some little kid in the backyard, you know, like stealing my vegetables, but I knew he was like, two houses down, I'd have some questions, you know? Well, I usually did it at nighttime. Sometimes I did it in the day. Okay, but gotcha. um, you know, I was very conspicuous when, when I did things like that. You know, yeah. I was very, I'd climb out of my window in the middle of the night and go steal vegetables for the next day, you know, yeah. because I knew I wasn't going to get any, because I couldn't stand conflict. If somebody had caught me, I probably would have cried and have been mortified. Yeah, you know, sure. if somebody would call me just because I was so, I was so 
I'm not going to say desensitized. I was hypersensitized by everything yeah. that was going on that I was completely broken inside. Yeah, you were. By the time the... I was a teenager, I, I just couldn't function anymore. I started failing at school. I mean, I was an academic for years, impressing no one because I mm. didn't have parents that cared, you know? Yeah. But um, it, we're, it, it just seems like you were really vulnerable, you know? It, terribly. But hadn't, look, once again, children don't know anything. Yeah. That's you right. don't even know you're in a bad situation unless yeah, right. somebody tells you, but nobody right. told you... me. But yeah, you I'll, give you a, I'll give you an interesting scenario, though. Many, many years later, when I went back for the very first time in 2006, and I brought my wife and my kids, we went to the town, and we went to my street, and we parked just a couple of houses over from my house where the creek is, and I was just standing there looking at the creek with my kids, kind of saying, yeah, this is where your dad grew up. And, and then all of a sudden, and this is in my book, all of a sudden, everybody starts coming out of their houses and starts coming over to me because they recognize me. Oh, wow. hmm. And everybody that went through it when I was a kid there still lived there in 2006. Wow. And they came up to me and they said, Michael, is that you? I'm like, yeah. You know, hi, Mr. So-and-so. And he's like, hmm. what happened to you was that was no good. That was no good. They were all saying the same thing. They all came out. In fact, I have a picture of it. My wife took a picture of all these people came out on the street. So they all acknowledged that something terribly was going, something terrible was wrong. Yeah. You know, but there was nothing they can do. You know, back in the 70s, nobody talked about nothing. Nobody That's did right. nothing. If That's it's right. not your family, it's not your business. Right. That's right. Okay. I remember. Yeah. 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 How did, how did, um, how did things get taken care of like that's normally quote unquote typical mom stuff like cleaning the house doing laundry. the laundry nothing. signing up for school nothing i did my own laundry from seven years old wow i i i made stole my own lunch um washed my own clothes um there was none in fact kids at school called me pig pen yeah. wow. i i you know, I didn't know what was right, what was, what was, uh, what, how do you say it, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, socially acceptable, you know, how clean your fingernails should be, or how dirty, you know, how many times you could wear your pants with dirt on them. <laughs> you know, I, I had no concept of any of that. You know, I so still have no concept of that now. at 40 years old, Michael. So, yeah, we okay. can attest yeah. to that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I have, I also have another question going yeah, back sure. a little bit. Were you, was your family uh, members of any church organization when you were a child? Yes. What was that? The Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm -hmm. And was your mom we an were, active member? Yes. And she was excommunicated. So really? was my father. Can you tell my us father about first and then my mother. what happened there and why were they excommunicated? Um, I'm not sure. You don't know, you don't find out these things. They're very, they're a cult, you know, the JWs okay. are a cult. I mean, they follow so one there, man, they follow child but there is, Excuse me, but there is a reason to believe that your mother and father were in some way familiar with the Bible. Oh, yeah. Well, my, my father, I think, got ex, excommunicated for, I, I think there was rumors going around that he was peddling drugs or something like that. There was no evidence of that. My dad was affiliated with mafia types like um, Luciano Pavarotti, you know, the tenor singer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my father was friends with him. They, you know, wow. they kind of, they spent a lot of decades together, him and his family. Luciano was mob, you know. Yep. But, uh, but my mother, why she was excommunicated, I have no clue. You don't find out those things and nobody tells and nobody, nobody asks. Yeah. So did you have any... Um teachings or knowledge or anything of the Bible as a young boy or growing up in relationship with the Bible or anything like that? I had a Noah's Ark as a kid that was that my mother later burned in the fireplace and set our house on fire. But other than that, that's another thing. I never had anything. I never had any toys. All my toys were burned. Wow. She threw everything in the fire. In fact, she set the fire, the house on fire probably 15 times. And the fire department came and came and came and came and came and came, you know, every winter 
you know, seven, eight times a, a winter, you know, because she set the place on fire. Jeez. You know, she put, wow. she shoved everything in the fireplace, and of course, caught the chimney on fire and parts of the attic, and the, it was a mess. But uh, you know, no, there was, there was n no presence of Christianity per se in that town. We, I think we were 4,300 people, and I think we had like, I don't know, six or seven churches, and I don't remember anybody who went to church. I don't remember <laughs> one person or one kid that, I, oh, wow. I'm going to church this weekend. I never heard it. <laughs> never heard it. Yeah. Never heard it. Yeah, you became a Christian. Tell us about that journey. You know, yeah, when did you that. come to Christ, and well, what brought you, you to you that You want to hear the worst of the story? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Whatever if you want, and, yes. So mark that down. You can ask me that after, after that. Will do. Well, Okay, so I'll take you back. So, so the, the period in time where my mom is hitting herself, like for, for hours on end, as soon as the sun starts going down, she goes in her room. That whole chaos starts. She starts screaming in the middle of the night. I run into her room. She's saying Satan is jumping on her from the ceiling, jumping on her chest. I'm hearing all this banging going on, and I'm just lying in my room with my hockey stick waiting till it's over. And then at some time during the night, it ends. And then I, I guess I fall asleep and then the next night starts and the whole thing starts all over again. So it's this repetitive thing that happens all day long and all night long. And it never stops. It never stops except mid this period in the middle of the night, you know, maybe four to 6 PM, you know? So one day I'm coming home, I'm now 16 years old and I'm six feet tall. 126 pounds skinny but tall and um, we have a basement that goes downstairs you can enter through the outside or you can enter through the inside you know from upstairs so you don't have to go outside mm -hmm. and one day i came home it was a nice warm day it was in the summer i i came downstairs and i came opened the door to the to the garage or to the basement and i see my mother there bent over with a hacksaw trying to cut off the chain. Now, at this point right here, I got to give you a visual of what my mother looked like. Four foot 10, morbidly obese, 250 to 300 pounds. Wow. Long hair down in her eyes, like you're about to hear. All of her teeth, and I don't know how, but all of her teeth were all broken and chipped. In fact, she used to, when I used to walk across the living room, she used to go, to me like this in this deaf mute kind of voice just like what i did and her tongue was all cut and serrated on both sides all her molars were all broken every one of her teeth were broken like somebody had been punching or beating her up and all her teeth were broken and chipped so i never got that she smelled like death and feces mm -hmm. just horrible horrible she wore the same clothes, which were all ripped and tattered, and she was all bloody in here from, you know, from whacking herself with the log. So when I, I'm downstairs, I see her hacking the, the chain, and the only thing I could do was yell, hey! So I yell, hey, she looks up at me like this through her hair, and she growls at me in this inhumane, inhuman voice. And she, she throws, the, throws the hacksaw down and runs upstairs like I've never seen her run before. She is morbidly obese at this point. She runs upstairs. I chased her, and I tell people, I tell people, at that point, I was drawn to the fire like a moth. I was shaking so bad, and it's like, it's you or me. It, this is it. I can't take this anymore because I was breaking down mentally. And I was falling apart at school. I wasn't going to school anymore. I was writing my own notes and all this kind of stuff. So she beats me upstairs, believe it or not. And she goes into her room and slams the door with such force. And we left our windows open during the summer. You know, this is, you know, 70s and 80s. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. And yeah. the panes of the glass shook all throughout the house. And I'm standing outside her door, and then I see the door bow like this. It bows out toward me. And I'm thinking to myself, damn, because the bow, I can, I can hear the door cracking. 
I can yeah. hear the door cracking. And yeah. I'm thinking to myself, she must be leaning on it with all her weight, you know, with her back, you know, because you'd think you'd get the most pressure by leaning with your back and pushing with your leg muscles, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. But she was holding the doorknob. And I was trying to get the doorknob and I was trying to twist the doorknob and I couldn't twist the doorknob, you know, and I could hear her breathing <laughs> like this behind the door. And I was like, I was like, this is it. This is it. I don't care if I die. I just want this to end, you know? So I'm like, I'm profusely sweating and I'm like, I'm waiting and I'm keep trying the doorknob and it won't budge. I mean, there's no way she's stronger than me. She's 4'10", you know? Right. So, yeah. So at that point, I'm just waiting and I'm kind of wringing my hands, you know, and then the bow in the door disappears and I could hear the door go, you know, and then I saw the doorknob relax. So I wring my hands and I go to open the door. I open the door really quick and just for a split second, our eyes met and my mother's eyes were just, and I know this sounds like so movie-ish, but it was true. They were just black balls just black glistening balls and the hatred on her face. And she raised up her hand like this and she came after me like that and I ran. And I ran, I ran outside so fast, fast as I ever ran, because I left all the doors open. I was a really lazy kid about that. I left all the doors open. <laughs> and then once again, like a few seconds later, I hear slam and all the panes of the glass are going <laughs> So now I'm standing on the driveway and I'm in trauma. I'm like going, <laughs> because of what I just saw and what I just heard, you know? And I'm like, that was not my mother. That's not my 410 mother, yeah. you know? And so I, I, I thought to myself, I got to call my dad. And I realized that my dad was in town that day. It was a Saturday. So, and I knew where he, where he was. So I reached in. We had one of those phones with the long cables like we were talking about before. It had a long cable on it so you could take yeah. it places. Yeah, and it just happened to be right inside the mudroom door to the living room. So mm -hmm. when you open that last mudroom door, it's right there against the wall. Mm -hmm. So I reached in, grabbed it, and went, out, went outside. And I swear it took me 15 or 20 minutes to dial the phone number because mm -hmm. it was a dial tone, and I couldn't get my finger in the right one or I'd do five numbers and then do the wrong number. I was in trouble. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I was shaking yeah. so bad that I couldn't put my finger in the right you sure. know, dial. Yeah, thing. The and you know, with dial tones, yeah. if you don't do it all the way around, you know, do it right <laughs> to the little, the little hook, it mm -hmm. doesn't go through. So it took me quite a while. Anyway, the lady answered the phone and, and I was going, <laughs> you know, and, and she recognized my, my, uh, my voice. And she called out my dad's name. My dad came to the phone. I couldn't say nothing. He said, I'm, I'm coming. I'm coming. So I slammed the phone down and I ran back outside. He was there in probably a minute because he was like a, a half a mile away. It's a small town, you know. Mm -hmm. So he shows up and he's asked, he comes out and gets out of the truck and he's like asking me, what's, what, what's, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? And I couldn't talk. I had no pattern of speech, no nothing. I couldn't put two words together. So he says, he starts going into the house. So I follow him in. He opens the screen door to the outside, the outside door, and then opens the, the, um, the door that's the mudroom door into the living room. He walks in. Soon as he walks in, my mother charges him, grabs him, throws him down. Now, my dad's 5'8", five eight, five eight, about 150 pounds. She throws him down and then starts scratching his face and going, ah, yeah, 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 scratching his face. My dad was in terror. He did not know what he, you know, at that moment he realized this is not the wife that I married. You know, this went on. I was just standing there like, I was like going like this. You know, my head was ready to explode. He managed to get out from under her and he ran outside and I ran out after him. And again, we heard slam and the windows just, you know, that was the first time in my life I saw my dad terrified. He was standing there. He was bent over. He had his hands on his knees and he was trying to process what just happened. He had no and idea I, this was going on. Well, he just thought she was crazy. 
And we never talked. We never talked about any of this. I just dealt with it. I just dealt with it. You know, our family never talked. That was that generation, you know? Yeah, that's true. So was there. my dad went in, got the phone, called the police department and called the mental institution. The mental, the mental institution, they all came out. They went in the house. My mother's room was right by the patio where you would be outside, where you come in the door. In fact, you could touch my mother's window from our front door. I heard my mother talking to the mental institution people in a normal voice. Yep. Or what was like, I could probably count on my hand less than three fingers how many times I heard my mother's normal voice. And she was talking to them completely normal, completely normal. My dad had scratches all over his face and and they took her away. They took her away in a, in a straitjacket. They took people away in straitjackets. This was the second time. They took her away. And I was like so relieved. I was like so relieved, but I was so messed up inside. I couldn't relax, you know, because nights were, you, you just don't, oh, now you can sleep. It doesn't work like that. You no. Know? Yeah, it doesn't. Three months later, they told me she was coming back. Gosh, man. But prior to that, I had an interview with CPS, mm -hmm. you know, the children's. And they told me, they told me to basically, not, not in these exact words, but they told me basically for me, run away and pursue a musical career because they didn't know what to do. Wow. They didn't Where's know what your, to do. Where was your dad in that? I mean, why did he not get involved and say, no, my son's going through this, I'm taking him or whatever? Well, th this is when everybody stepped in, the authorities, CPS. They told okay. me to run away. That's what they told me to do. They said, you need to get out. You see, the first time she went to the mental institution when she tried to kill my sister, something happened there that right. was beyond their diagnosis, I recollect. Because when I was researching to write the book, and the book was never meant to be public, it was for my daughters, I happened to call the mental institution in 2018, I think it was. And I said, I'm doing some research for a book. Can you give me this lady's um, records? And she said, oh, sure. It cost you like 35 bucks. And uh, they said, well, from what year was it from? I said, well, it was between like 74 and 84. And they said, oh, we wouldn't have those records. She goes, well, just, just for giggles, just give me your name into it. So I'm hearing her. Hmm. I'm hearing that. Mm -hmm. And she goes, well, that's weird. She goes, <laughs> the records have been kept and they've been archived off campus. So wow. I said, oh, okay. Okay. So she goes, I'll have to call you back when I get the records. So I waited a week. No one called me. I called back again. I didn't, I didn't know who the lady was I talked to. I asked for the records. Well, there's no records. There's no, I said, could you check? They're archived off, off of, uh, okay, let me put in her name. Uh, no, there's nothing there. Nothing in the archives. Oh, and wow. I talked to a guy who was an exorcism in Canada in the middle 70s. Mm -hmm. And he told me that that would have been protocol because when they did something supernatural that was beyond their diagnosis. Those cases were Purge. rejected and put away. And that's exactly what they did. Is they And then they brought her back three months later. Yeah. And you were still at home? And I was still at home. And I said, I can't do this anymore. And I was 18 and I left and I went and lived with my sister. And, to, and then I lived with my sister for one year. And then I went to California, was homeless in California. And that's where part two starts. Wow. And when you're referring to that, you're referring to uh, Devil Take the Hindmost, part one and two, right? Part two, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So. My goodness. And that second, so in that second book really kind of picks up where you're in California trying to rebuild or build a life. Yeah. You know, dealing with and the I'm fallout homeless. of all this. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And everybody thinks, well, you must have been, oh, you're 3,000 miles away. It was just as bad. That's when all the PTSD started to come because now I was free of the situation. Right. And that's how the body works. And then yep. I started to I started to have severe PTSD. And I have it so bad to this day that when 
you know, during the day and at nighttime, my face goes numb. Soon as the sun goes down, my face goes numb. Sometimes so bad I can't even speak and I got to take medication to knock me out or else I pass out. I, I can't take medication. I, I'll pass out. And I've been to the hospital so many times. So, you know, people ask me, oh, you're just doing this to sell books. And I'm like, okay, let me show you all the medical records. If you think that this was a horrible story, I can tell you the horrible trauma that I still have 50 years after that I still pass out. And I still can't function in life. That's why I'm a musician. I go play for two hours and I'm gone, you know, because I can't function. <laughs> uh, I love that last part uh, where he talks about, you know, being accused of just wanting to sell books. And I don't know if it made the final edit or not, but uh, I did say something in there to the effect of like, uh, yeah, like those people have no idea <laughs> what they're talking about right. because, like, if you're just looking to make a bunch of money, guess what? The solution is not books. Books, yeah, yeah, that's not the way to make money. Uh, no, it is not. <laughs> so, um, really enjoyed um, our conversation with Michael. Yeah, and, um, you know, uh, reading his body language, being around other people uh, whom I care about who have PTSD. You know, I tend to believe what he's saying. Yeah. You know, um, or at least he believes what he's saying. For sure. You know, like there's there's not a lot of phoniness. There's no phoniness there. It's, yeah. it's very genuine. And well, uh, demon possession is real, and PTSD is real. Yeah. And and that's one thing a lot of people don't talk about. You know, they don't talk about the correlation between the two of like. I mean, imagine, imagine if you were around somebody who was demon possessed. Yeah, that's a traumatic experience. Oh yeah, for sure. You know, and um, people think PTSD is something that only happens in the desert in a uniform. That's like, no. Nah. I mean, it also doesn't really happen. It gets. It's one of those phrases like narcissist and gaslighting that gets overused yeah. by the divorcee crowd. You know, <laughs> like, hey, my husband, my ex-husband, he he just he's gaslighting he's me all the time, me. and he was narcissistic, and <laughs> and I have trauma from that. And I'm like, uh, yeah, all right, like you know, ease down there, Ripley. Like <laughs> you know, no, you probably don't. You just you know didn't you regretted your decision and you probably are a little spoiled yeah but like no dude like you know michael and yeah dude he's he's seen some stuff you could see it in his expressions but anyways um with that misogynistic rant if you would like to <laughs> it's not misogynistic at all it's absolutely the truth and uh, i don't care if you don't like it uh, <laughs> i regret nothing i regret nothing um if you would like to uh support us we have a patreon <laughs> um smooth that was really yeah, smooth yeah, real smooth jonathan uh, smooth as gravel. Um, you can scan the QR code that's on your screen right now, or you can go to patreon.com forward slash the goslings. And uh, I will not stop talking about it until somebody scans it. So uh, if you want to see the second <laughs> half of the interview, uh, one of you damn well better scan that QR code. Scan it. <laughs> scan it. Because so, uh, we get notifications when you do. So uh, we have a Patreon. And um, really, at its core, the main reason why we started the Patreon was not just to support the channel with like paying for the subscriptions for the services that we use and also like upgrading our equipment, which we have been able to do thanks to you guys. Uh, it also is a platform that allows us to air the full unedited interviews, including this one Yeah, where, you know, we got channel strikes in the past. So um, having our full unedited interviews on Patreon allows us to ask the questions that we want to ask and that you guys want us yeah, that's to right. ask, uh, in a private environment separate from the community guidelines that YouTube loves to weaponize against people trying to talk about the truth and trying to talk about unpopular realities. Mm. Uh, so, but the well Patreon said. is the place. Thank you. Uh, Patreon is uh, the place where you can go to get the full unedited interviews. And a lot of people really enjoy them and you get them early. That's the other yeah. thing. Uh, like we just interviewed Steven Pressfield mm -hmm. today and Nick posted the full interview on our page. It's already there. Yeah. Like a half hour before we went live with this. Yep. So you get early access. You also get a ton of other stuff. That we, interview is not even coming out for two weeks. Yeah. You can see the whole thing right now. Yeah. You can go including watch Including the exclusive right portion. Yeah. And I highly recommend everybody who's watching to go back. Even if you think you don't care, go back and watch our previous interviews with Stephen Pressfield. Uh, it is uh, those are criminally underwatched interviews, and he is 
the Jedi master of writing and creativity. Yeah. So it's, uh, but aside from that, the Patreon is a great place where we have discounts on merchandise. We have a whole Teespring page set up. Um, you can, depending on what tier you're at, you can get everything from just the schedule uh, all the way up to, um, you can be like uh, a sponsor for the channel if you want to. Uh, we can give you shout outs. Uh, you get signed copies of our books. You know, you get, we got a bunch of different levels, but we wanted to structure it in a way that if we were in your guys' shoes, we would say, oh, this is worth $5. This is, if you want to support the channel, this is worth, you know, $10, $20, $50, even $100 a month to, you know, get all this stuff out of it. We even have like an exclusive t-shirt that's just for patrons. Yep. Um, so it's, uh, it's something that we really wanted to build, not just to provide more services for people but also to protect the channel and uh and you know just show your support and i'll be honest with you, there are a lot of really successful youtube channels that have like two tiers and it's like oh ten dollars a month just to show your support or like fifty dollars a month and you get to ask a question at one question one time yeah and get an answer and it's like so dude what? we do more than that yeah we get we, a little more than that we threw a lot of stuff yeah. at uh at that patreon and uh we were really proud of it and uh, we think people will really enjoy it. No one has scanned it. But I'm going to leave the little QR code up there in a the corner. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we'll be watching during mm -hmm. part two of this interview that I'm about to play here in a second mm -hmm. with Michael uh... Galliardi. 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 I've, mm -hmm. I've been working on it, Michael. I've been trying real hard. Mm -hmm. uh, but I am from the South. <laughs> so you're going to have to be patient with me. <laughs> uh, but man, I really enjoyed speaking with him, hearing his story, and you've only heard the first half of his story. Yeah, and, the first uh, half of the public interview. I'm trying to remember how long we talked to him in the Patreon exclusive. Uh, it was a good half hour, at least. Yeah, which yeah. is actually kind of standard, if not minimum, yeah. for our Patreon exclusive yeah. questions. Um, Indeed. And one of the things you get with the Patreon, because uh, I told you, I'm not going to stop talking about it till one of you scans that QR code. So Please you, scan the code. Yeah, so if you want to watch this other one, you better scan that QR code or go home. Uh, <laughs> um, but one of the things we also do offer is uh, people get to submit questions to the guests. So mm. we give you a heads up, mm -hmm. usually a day in advance of yep. you know, our guests. Now you get the full schedule every month. But we do a reminder. We tell you about who the guest is, what we've been on talking about. And if you want to ask that person a question, such as Stephen Pressfield, Michael Galliardi, um, you know, thanks, I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> David Thibodeau, you know, yeah. uh, the Waco survivor, or Vicki Joy Anderson, you know, or, or Gary Wayne. We got Gary Wayne coming back in yeah, October. Yeah, Gary Wayne. You know, so like if you are interested in, uh, in like having us ask a question on your behalf in the interview and getting their answer, then the Patreon tiers are where you need to be for that. That's right. So, That's right. Yeah. Well, guys, thank you for being patient through all that. We still don't have any scans. We're going to come back after the second part and harass you some more. It's yeah. going to happen. <clears throat> Just know that. But with an act of benevolence, we will play part two for you Nick now. is being merciful because I'll tell you, like, cooperation is not... Uh, is not an option for me so like i literally would tank this entire live stream and <laughs> sit here i would leave it running constantly until somebody scans it you know so yeah. you you really should thank nick for i don't want to do that because kind of... i want to get sushi <laughs> right i know yeah we got to go get sushi yeah. we are on a time crunch so all right uh this next one is a little over 48 minutes yeah. so uh enjoy part two with michael galliardi galliardi yeah so much fun to say hey, once you figure it out i know it how has that affected your relationships in your adult life? I mean, you're married. Yes. Well, <laughs> I married someone who, believe it or not, I asked the Lord before I was a Christian to give me the wife that I needed. And mm -hmm. he did. And when I came to California, I met her 12 days later after I was homeless in Santa Monica, which I went to Santa Monica because I used to watch Three's Company. And I saw mm. them on the pier, and I knew that was a real place. So that's where I ended up. <laughs> nice. Wow. So that's where book two starts. And, you know, book two, you know, some people think, well, all the good stuff is in book one because they want the demonic possession stuff. Well, you right, know, the sensationalism. I, tried, I tried to not make it about my mom. I mean, I told a lot of stuff in there, but, you know, I didn't want to give the demons credit for my story. 
Jesus yeah. is the one I wanted to give credit to my story. So, <laughs> you know, I, I tell the story from this position, not as a victim, but as how Christ got me through this, that I enjoyed nature as a kid. Uh, you know, I didn't mind sleeping outside, you know, in a park to be away from my mother because nature was so beautiful. And right. I ate vegetables out of garden because those were God's vegetables, you know, even though I wanted like Twinkies and cupcakes and crap yeah. like that, but never got it, you know. Yeah. So I tell it per, from that perspective. And I know I've gotten a couple of reviews from people. It's not what I expected because they wanted a Hollywood. And then she spit peas at me and, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I mean, there's, there's kind of stuff like that in there, but I didn't want I didn't want to to make it give them the glory. I wanted to give yeah. Christ the glory, you know, how Absolutely. I survived, you know. Which brings me to another time. question. Unless I'm getting ahead of what you want. Well, to do. I was I was just going to ask, you know, what happened to your mom after you left? Well, that's an interesting story, and when I came to when I came to California. And I had met my wife 12 days later. I gave some people that I knew, uh, some family members, uh, my phone number to where they could get a hold of me. And they got a hold of me uh, two weeks later and said, We're, we have you know, bad news. Your mother passed away. And I, you know, I wasn't shocked at all by it. And they said that she had passed away. They had found her only because she was decomposing and they could smell it in the apartment. So that's how they found her. And they said that the coroner's report said that she had died, you know, because they can tell right down to the day that she had died on this date. And that date was the day that I left for California. So it was like, wow, you know, that the demons had done their job. And, you know, I always say this in interviews that my mother was never the target. It was me. Because I'm the one who became a Christian. I'm the only Christian in the family. Really? So, you know, you know how in the Bible, God always tells his plans. And then the, and then Satan goes and does something, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, he declared war in Genesis 3.15. He says, here's my plans. You know, the mm-hmm. saviors are coming, you know. And, mm-hmm. and uh, they knew. They knew that the whole thing with my mother, my mother was just a vehicle. You know, yeah. but she was a willing participant. And that's the thing. She s- seeked out her father through a seance, yeah. which I know she knew the Bible enough to know that that was wrong, but she did it anyway. And that was the entry point. And if you've ever heard of, of the, if you've ever read the transcripts of when people come to pro, um, possessed, where it begins and how long it, be, how long it takes, People don't, it's not like in the movies where, you know, you can come, come in to me and not them. And then all of a sudden, rah, rah, rah. Mm-hmm. that's not how it works. You have to be a willing participant. You have to have entry. You have to have permission because God allows it. If you're going to ask for it, he's going to say, okay, here you go. Yep. You know, and they're only allowed to do so much. You know, they're still under a limitation. They can't just do whatever they want with you, you know, and they want to hide. You know, they want rest and they want to hide. And they'll hide out and mimic as many diseases and as many mental illnesses as they possibly can, mm-hmm. you know, to keep that that uh, truth hidden. Because that's what they do, right? They lie. They they, yeah. they twist the truth, you know. And how mental, was it that, a lot of mental illness is a lie, you know. Yeah. How was it that your mom actually died? She died of atherosclerosis, the hardening of the arteries from her ravenous eating. She was 46 years old and had no gray hair. Wow. 46. And where was your dad during that time? Um, he was still living in the house that I had left. Gotcha. And yeah. they had split at that time. And she had an apartment. He got her an apartment in a, in a, a town half an hour away. So, so he was living on his own. And then I think, and in fact, you know, I don't want to tell the whole story, but in fact, I went to see her one more time before I left. I thought I owed it to her one more time before I left. When I had my ticket to California and everything, my dad drove me there. I went up the stairs. She lived in a small apartment above a grocery or a, a, like a convenience store, you know, on a main street in a little town. I went up the stairs. I knocked on the door. She answered the door, never even looked at me like she knew I, she knew I was there. 
I was coming. She never even looked at me. She just opened the door. I came in. She, I followed her. She sat on her bed. I sat on the bed. I hadn't even said a word to her. She reached over to her desk, pulled out the drawer, got a letter, gave me the letter. And then immediately she lied down, started going, and started doing this. And then that's when I went, I've had it. And I walked out the door and that was the last time I saw her. And that was it. So, and everybody asks me what was in the letter. Sure. Well, the, yeah. the letter is going to be from, for the book three, you know, when, because right now I've moved so many times that I, I know the contents of the letter, but I don't know the exact wording, but I have it here somewhere, but I've moved so many times. I, it's in a box somewhere and I can't find it. And everybody asks me what was in the letter, but I'll tell you one thing about the letter. The letter was very weird and prophetic in nature, not biblical prophetic, but um, yes. prophetic from a demonic, right. from a demonic standpoint. And that's all I can really say because I don't want to not do it justice sure. because I'm not, it's not in front of me. Yeah. You know? And I don't want you to give anything away that you're saving for your book, but what, where should well, I really don't remember what it said. I know some of it, what it said and the, the key points that I remember are bizarre. And when yeah. I started doing research on the key points that she said on that, I was like, wow, what, what kind of information and who was this from? Because it wasn't from my mother. Where is your dad now? What is he doing? My dad is now 87 years old and he lives in Ontario, Canada still. Mm -hmm. And he's tired and he goes dancing. <laughs> do, you still, dancing. do you have a relationship with him? Yes, I do. But it Good. came at a great pain. I had to yell at him. We had a breakdown one day where I yelled and cursed and called him everything in the book and told him what a crappy childhood I had and yeah. blah, 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 blah. And after that, um, we became friends. Uh, my dad also has PTSD because he grew up in World War II. Mm. Um, he was just a child when all the bombs were going off. He remembers, you know, hiding in caves in Italy and then bombs going off and they tried to bring their donkey in and their donkey got blown up by a by a bomb and all the guts went on him and all his, his kids. Wow. You know, and then he was in a refugee camp for like four years. And so he has tr PTSD from all the bombs going off. And, you know, because when the, when the allies came on the beaches of Anzio in Italy, mm -hmm. they were told to, as they retreated, they were told to blow up everything. So they blew up my father's house. My, my father was a non-fascist. Mussolini wanted to kill him. So he ran and hid in the in the caves in the high country until the war was over, <laughs> you know, because he wasn't a he wasn't a fascist. He didn't want to join the Italian army, wow. you know. So and then they reunited in a refugee camp years later after the war. So so how, he's all messed up. <laughs> how is how has this complete absence of a mother's love and the uh, probably the feeling that your father never protected you and all of this and that your sister abandoned you and all these certain other feelings and other things that I can't imagine. How has that affected your relationships with people in your older age? Like just other people, not your family. Well, they've, they've, I don't have a whole lot of relationships. I, I keep to myself for that very issue mm -hmm. because when I came down here as a 19 year old and I met, and I met what was, who would soon be my wife. I couldn't even talk on the phone. I was so inept socially. Mm -hmm. I couldn't even talk on the phone. I was terrified of mm -hmm. social engagement. I couldn't talk on the phone. My wife, Sherry, had to do all my correspondence for me, you know, because mm -hmm. back then we had the phone, right? We didn't have a right. phone. You know, we had the phone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's right. The phone, and baby. Even to this day, I mean, I do a lot of gigs. You know, I do like 100, 180 to 200 gigs a year. And I don't stick around for people to say, oh, you were great, or I don't stick around for it. I'm out the door because I'm uncomfortable with the social. You know, I'm like Neil Peart, if you know how Neil Peart was. You know, after a rush show, he went running out the door yeah. into his into his uh, Cadillac or whatever yeah. and then went to the hotel. Fantastic I'm totally that guy. Neil Peart. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. One of the best. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm totally that guy. I... I I have a hard time, but people ask me, I mean, I'm a worship leader, 
I stand in front of people and perform in front in front of people seven days a week, or maybe seven to ten times a week. That's awesome. People ask me, "How do you do that?" I said, "Well, it's the grace of God." Yeah, you right. Know, it's the grace of God. Yeah. I couldn't well, even I, speak. I, couldn't even put I would love to hear the story of how you came to to be a Christian and and how you met the Lord. And yeah, all how'd that. you get but saved, Michael? Nick, no, no, no. Let's let's do that. And that's great. You, you want to hear it, or you want to save it how, for another yeah, how day? How do you find God? How do you find you? Yeah, go it, ahead, please. Okay. Well, I'll put it kind of in a nutshell for you. Um, when my, my wife and I got married, I think we were about a year into our our, uh, our marriage, and the PTSD started to break me down. I was like, what's wrong with me? I got all these issues. What's wrong with you? I never equated my childhood as the source of my, you know, depression, my mental angst. You know, mm-hmm. I, I could never put my finger on it. And we started to not get along very good. Um, we broke up for a while. Um, I had an affair. And while I was living away, um, my wife told me that she was pregnant with our first kid. Mm. And that was like a bomb going off in my face. And I, I cried. I cried several weekends over it. I didn't know what to do. I was falling apart. And then one afternoon I was going to see her. I gave her all my money, my truck, everything, the house, everything. I gave her, in fact, a little funny side story. I was so poor during that time that the PR person for Sebastian hair care products, you know, Sebastian hair care. Mm-hmm. If you know Sebastian hair care. Yeah, yes. 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 Well, it, that was Vinnie Vincent from Kiss's wife. She was oh, taking really? care of me during that time. Cause I had no money. And she, she was the head of the public relations department and they were always having these parties. And she says, there's so much food left over. And I said, well, can you bring it to me? And so she would pack me up all these, all this food for me. <laughs> so, yeah, I got a whole bunch of side stories, crazy like that of all same famous people here and there. But uh, um, so I was going to see her one day and I was, I was, I was so contrite in my spirit I didn't know what to do. Here she's pregnant. I'm I'm you know seeing this other girl and I'm just a mess. I'm a wreck. So I'm for the people that know California, I'm going down Ventura Boulevard on an RTD bus because I have nothing. I gave her everything. I had seven dollars a week to live on. And I was going by Taft High School, and I'll never forget this. And I said, I looked out the window and I was bawling my eyes out. And there must have been 40 people on the bus and they were all looking at me and I couldn't care less. I looked out the window and I was looking at the football field or the soccer field. And I said, God, if you're there, I've made a mess of my life and I need you to come and help me. I surrender to you. And at that moment, it, like I said, it was a Paul Tarsus moment. At that moment, I, I felt the veil be lifted. And I was able to look at everything the way it was, breaking down, aged, and seeing the light and knowing who Jesus was. I can't, I can't explain it to you. All I can say is that he said, my sheep know my voice. Mm, sure. And that's all I heard the shepherd. I didn't hear an audible voice, but I heard the shepherd. And two weeks later, two weeks later, I was thirsty for knowledge. I'm like, I keep telling my wife, she thought I was nuts. I said, hmm. something happened to me and I can't pinpoint it. So I went out and I, I rented Franco Zeffirelli's Jesus of Nazareth. You know, it's like eight hours long. Mm-hmm. And the point where he says, you know, because it's a red letter movie, right? All Jesus's words are, are said to the letter. Mm-hmm. And he goes, and when he says, the sheep know my voice, for I am the shepherd. <gasps> and I just lit up like, oh. Sherry's Sherry was cutting vegetables in the kitchen. I said, that's who I met on the bus. Hmm. That's who I met on the bus. And she's just like, Oh my God, what am I, <laughs> what, what have I done? I've left it. I, I've, I've, I've allowed this Charles Manson back into my life. <laughs> <laughs> so I told her, I said, I want to go to church. I want to go to church. So I went to church and that weekend, in fact, it was David Miller at the um, Simi Valley Church, uh, a church of Rocky Peak. And uh, he says, and I'm going to quote him. He says, and 
Joseph of Arimathea goes to Jesus. And Jesus says to him, well, you must be born again. And Jesus says, don't worry about, you know, don't worry about being born again. It's, 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 you know, the spirit comes and goes where it goes. And then he starts speaking on being born again. And I look over to my wife and I said, that's what happened to me. That's who spoke to me. And this is the answer for what's changed in me, that I'm not the same person. Because I knew all this stuff that I had changed and I was this new person. Who was this new person? I didn't like those things. I saw the evil in those things that I loved before. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's who spoke to me and that's what happened. Now I had an explanation because God knew because of my past that anyone's opinion talking to me about Jesus, I wasn't going to cut it. You're just a man. You're just as flawed. My parents were so flawed. You can't be any better. They were the people that were supposed to love me. And here's your relationship stuff. Those were the people that were supposed to love me. They threw me on the, under the bus. And your opinion means less than that. So you telling me about Jesus, which no one ever did, but that was my philosophy. No one's going to tell me that. So Jesus had to do it on his own. And he did it on that bus. Wow. In Ventura Boulevard in front of Taft High School. That's and, I met Jesus, and then he gave me the answer to what happened to me. He said, it was me, the shepherd, and you heard my voice. And then what happened to you? You were born again. I found out that the, the next week later when I went mm -hmm. to church. So right then I knew I was yeah, like, yeah. Oh, no. wow. so it was amazing. And in fact, I went back to that church and I told my story to over 3000 people. I, I was able to tell my testimony because I told somebody at church and they're like, oh, are you kidding? That's what happened. And I'm like, yeah, doesn't that happen to everybody? Isn't that how it, how it all happens for everybody? And they're uh -huh. like, no. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, it just happened on a bus, man. And I just cried out to God. I was crying in front of people. And that's what happened. <laughs> you know? That's crazy. And then from crazy. then on, from then on, in my wife's family, everybody started coming to the Lord. Oh, uh, really? That's not how it works yeah. sometimes. Yeah. 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 And, and it was as if that's what her family needed was to bring me 3,000 miles away. What you think you were, what was Satan was corrupting and breaking there, I'm going to use for good over here. Yeah. And then yes. everyone in her family is saved now. That's cool. Beauty from ashes, baby. That yes. is cool. Love it. Yeah. What, about, what about your kids? I mean, did, did you, um, as they were growing up, did you share your, your story with them? No. No, they knew something was wrong because, you know, adults talk as if children don't know. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. and then when my kids got older, I kind of gave them, you know, the, you know, the paraphrased version. And they told me, you know, because they knew it was bad. And plus, they've got kids, young kids of their own. So there's no time to, hey, let's sit down, you know, two hour conversation like we're having. Right. There was yeah. never time. So that's where the book comes in. Over COVID, I said, you know what? I'm going to write a book and I'm going to leave it all. So when your kids grow up and you're ready to read this, here it is. Yeah. yeah. So as I'm writing the book, because it took eight months, as I'm writing the book, my girls, because I have two girls, my, my girls are asking me, how, how's the book going on? By the way, they're in their 30s. So. Okay. And they're going, how's the book going on? And I said, yeah, it's going good. And they said, and then they said to me, dad, you really should go public with this because you always told us you wish somebody was there to rescue you you might be the catalyst in your book for somebody to get rescued. Oh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. No yeah. doubt. That kind of opened my eyes and I went, yeah. But then I was thinking about it, but I wasn't quite convinced. I was leaning. But then one day I rented the documentary um, Hostage to the Devil, which is a documentary on the life of um, Malachi Martin, Father mm. Malachi Martin. Yep. And it was about all of his exorcism. And... The guy that produced the movie also narrates it. And I thought, when the movie was over, I thought, wow, this guy, he doesn't sound like a believer, but he's really compassionate, you know, toward the subject that he spent four years of his life making this movie. Mm -hmm. So I said, what the heck? Because there's one thing about, you know, being a musician and being some sort of artist is rejection. Yeah, and when, yeah. you've been, when you've been beat up as a child, the last thing you want to do is re get rejected as an adult. So that's yeah. why I didn't want to put the book out there. So I, I 
sent him a message and I said, Hey, I've got this story. If you'd be interested, you know, real humble and like, yeah, whatever. I never hear from him. And he writes me back and he says, Michael, send me the manuscript. So he's the, he's the producer of the movie hostage to the devil. He's in Belfast, Ireland. So I send him the, the manuscript, I think on Friday and he gets back to me on a Monday and he goes, Michael, this is the craziest story I've ever heard. He goes, this is insane. And I said, yeah, well, unfortunately it's all true. And it's like my eyewitness account. And, uh, but he, he told me, he said, he said, bro, you got to put it out there. You, he said, you, when I did research for this, he said, he said, you have no idea how many stories and people are living in a shell because they're afraid people won't believe them and their lives oh, yeah. are destroyed. Their lives are destroyed in so many ways, you know? And I said, I said, right, man. I said, you know what? You convinced me. My kids said the same thing. Now you're telling me. So I, I got to put it out there. And I tell you, honestly, when I uploaded the book, when I pressed the upload thing and it said, it is now finished. You know, your book has been uploaded to Amazon. I was terrified because I was terrified of people saying, oh, you're writing the book for to make money and it, it's sensationalism. And I tried to stay away from all that kind of stuff. I didn't yeah. even write the book for anybody but my kids, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, but, you know, and I don't still today, I don't care about book sales. You know, it's not like I sell a million books and I'm, I'm wealthy. I know. It's but so you funny. In my when... situation, you'd think it was pathetic, but you know, <laughs> well, that's why I'm at life. It's so funny. When, function, you know, it's so funny when people say that about, you know, about uh, a book that you've published, you know, they say, oh, yeah, you're just doing this to make money. It's like, look, if I were looking to make money, you know, what the last thing I would devote like a year or two of my time is to doing right, writing right. a book, self-publishing a book. Yeah. Life changing money from a book unless yeah. you're uh, about you're four a New York people on the earth. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And yeah. nobody in this room. Yeah. Including <laughs> us right. who are authors. Right. Like, <laughs> yeah. So. so I've been pretty I've been pretty blessed because, you know, you know, I tell people, I said, you know, in a really bad car crash, you would expect really bad damage, right? Yeah. A lot of yeah. scars. I said, well, I've got the medical records to prove what I went through. 50 years later, I still have severe PTSD where my face goes numb every night and every morning. I mean, I wake up, my alarm clock is my face stinging with pins and needles because my medication's worn off and I can't take it anymore. And I have to take the next medication to subside the anxiety and the PTSD. Wow. That's how bad it is. Wow. You know, and this is 50 years later, you know, but I've been blessed to have people, most people that contact me have, have said, you know, thank you. You know, my, my, my brother-in-law or sister-in-law is going through something similar. We're not mm -hmm. sure what it is. And I, you know, and I tell them, I tell them, get down in Jesus name and figure it out because it's going to destroy your life. That, that's what it's all meant to do. The, the agenda is to destroy Robin Steele, period. Yeah. Whatever they can in whatever area of your life they can, if not kill you, you know, yeah. ultimate, that's the ultimate goal is to take you to hell, you know, yeah. so you're a lost, a lost soul, you know, but they want to rob, steal your joy and take everything away from you. And that's what their intent is. Every time, and they hate you. They hate you, but you need to, the second you come face to face with someone that you think, I'm not sure if they have mental illness. And then you start saying, what's your name? Yeah. What's your name? I know who you are. They have to respond. They have to respond because you're doing it in Jesus name. So you're using Jesus's command to bring them forward. And that's how you know, that is the litmus test for a demonically possessed person is what happens after you name the name of Jesus and you say to that person, you say to that person, demonic entity, speak to me. What is your name? In Jesus' name, I command you. That is the litmus test in every case, every time. Because if it's just nonsense, you know what's going on. He has to come forward upon Jesus' command. He has to come forward. And the world doesn't know that. They think they need a priest. <laughs> And that's the biggest yeah. joke. I mean, if you want, if you want to stay, stay safe, 
in your Hubble, what's the best way to do it? Is to have a fake exorcism, right? Have only a certain group of people which you're kind of commanding and giving them the way to do it so that you never leave. I mean, the Annalise Michelle case, they exercised her 67 times. 67 times? Jesus, one time. He said, well, you'll cast them out one time only if they're mutant, if they're the mute, the mute demons. Then that kind, he said, comes out by prayer and fasting, fasting. fasting. and prayer. Yeah. There's your categories of how to get rid of them right there. There are no other categories. They come out in Jesus name. And when you speak Jesus name and confront them and ask them their name, now you're addressing them and they can't hide anymore. But that's what they want. They want to hide. They want to stay as long in that body as they possibly can. And, you know, I, I was I was telling this to, to people. In the last three months, I've had three people on the street come up to me and yell at me in, in foreign languages in distorted voices because they know who I am. They know who I am. And I've seen them running away when I, I'll turn around and I'll say, in Jesus' name. In fact, I, got, I almost got hijacked in a parking lot from a woman who I thought was a man was behind me, cursing me with, with a distorted man's voice. And I turned around and it was a woman. And all I did, I turned around and I was like, oh my gosh, it's a woman. And I said to her, I said to her, Jesus name. And then she went running down the street with her hands over here screaming. That's happened to me three times in the last, I'd say four months. Wow. Wow. You know, they, they know who you are. They know who you are. Yeah. There's not a whole lot of veil between hmm. us and them. They know who we are. We know who they are. That's why they want to hide. They don't want to get kicked out. Yeah. You know? Amazing. Man. I've seen it. I lived with it. You know? Mm -hmm. They're crafty. They're intelligent. In fact, I'll tell you this, this point. My, I heard my mother's voice two times in through all of these years of all of this possession stuff. And the two times she spoke in a lucid voice, she said the exact same thing to me as I was walking through the living room to go out the door. I'm walking by two times, probably three months apart. She said to me, this is exact. I'm walking across and she said to me, they're running up the back of my spine and perching in my head. And then all of a sudden, and then she starts going into all of this. And that was it. She said that to me two wow. times. You know, she said, they're running up the back of my spine and perching in my head, coming into my head and perching there. If you know what the word perch means, perch means to overlook. You know how our gargoyle perches? Yeah. Stands yeah. over and overlooks and observes everything. They come up through the spinal cord because the spinal cord is what controls, controls the speech, controls the eyes, the tongue, the hands. It controls everything. That, that's the control center. Mm -hmm. And that's where they re, that's where they come into. That's how wow. they're able, that's what that's how they're able to possess that's what possess means it means to take control of of, of the uh, part of the cortex that that gives the person mobility and speech yeah you know and reason sure. they come over and take over that so that taking over is what possession is all about that's and that's when you become truly possessed when they're able to speak through you then that's you know that's end game stuff you know, but it all starts with the, it all starts with that. You've done something wrong when you know you're hearing that, yeah. you know, that's where it starts because they have, there's a process in which they have to be invited and to mm -hmm. come in. And it's if like you by study degrees, the, like by degrees. The, yes, it comes by degrees because the person always has the ability to say, I don't want any part of this. And I yeah. command you in Jesus name to leave. So they're very crafty and they've got time on their hands. You know, they've got time. They know their time is coming, but they know our weaknesses. They know your weaknesses. They know our vulnerabilities. They know, they know your family history. They know everything about you. So you're on, you are already in that battle. You're at a, at a disadvantage, great disadvantage, except when you use the name of Jesus, you know? Yeah. What's Not your Mary. warning for people? Like, how do you, what would be your warning to people? Like, to the, what is the very first invitation? What are some things that you would uh, warn people against? The dabbler. Being Talk curious. Yes. 
if you're curious, uh, um, if you pick up a Ouija board for fun, um, it's not fun to the enemy because what you're doing, that's necromancy. Mm -hmm. That's just another object in our time. That's necromancy. You know, back in the ancient days, they had the ove. You go down into the dark pit and bring the spirits of the, Nef of the Rephaim, the Nephilim back. You bring those spirits, the old kings. It's no different. It's no different. And these, stay away from these, these, these EVPs. That's necromancy stuff. You're asking the, the entity to communicate with you. You're, ha you're wanting a conversation. For one thing, you have no business having a conversation with a foul spirit. <laughs> Number right. two, you do not have the mind to deal with a foul spirit who is right. way more intelligent than you are. Mm -hmm. And number three, you're going to lose every time. And then you're going to get yourself in trouble. And depending on how deep the trouble it is, you could lose your life. Someone close to you could lose, you lose their life. You know, mm -hmm. you're the dabbler and the curiosity. Stay away from it all. There's a reason why God said it was punishable by stoning to death. For trying to contact spirits, okay? It, it, that doesn't mean going to somebody. It's contacting spirits. There's a word for it, and it's necromancy. You don't do that because it works. Yeah. And that's the thing that people have to understand. It works. Therefore, there's a penalty, capital punishment for it in the Old Testament because it works. That's why God said to stay away from it because you know why? Once somebody does that, then that's like a cancer. That's like mm -hmm. a cancer because that person could be very, very prosperous. We see in Athens when, when Paul went there, right? People were business off the prophetess who was there, you know, telling people's future, making a lot of money. You see, they, they, they know your vulnerabilities. They know you want, you want, you know, girls and money or whatever mm -hmm. your, your crutch is. They know. And they're going to provide you with that. And you're going to find it amazing. You're going to find, wow, I have like the favor, like the favor of the Lord. Mm -hmm. You know, the man that has the favor of the Lord, that everything he touches, like Joseph, you know, 100 times a day, I have to explain how J Joseph did that. Joseph did that. You know, Potiphar, mm -hmm. you know, he's great at this. That's the favor of the Lord. Well, they'll do a false, they'll do a false, a false version of that, a mirroring of that. And of course, you can get rich. You know, you can get rich. You can't sell your soul to the devil. That's a myth. Mm -hmm. But you can sure worship him and get the things that he offers. Because remember, he said to Jesus, look at all the kingdoms, the glories, the riches, all this I will give to you. Yeah. If you just bow down and worship, Jesus never said, those aren't yours to give. He knew right. those were his to give. Yeah. Adam forfeited them. Mm -hmm. So... That that's a that's another discussion about who's rich yeah. and who's famous. <laughs> yeah. And how did yeah. you get there? You know, because there's a lot of filters getting up to levels like that, my friends. Let me tell you. Oh yeah. That's another story. <laughs> uh, that would be a good part too, Michael, to bring you back. Yeah, I yeah, can tell that you that be... about the music industry, about the I filters. Would love... Yeah, well, I was going to ask about that because wow. I was in the music business too for about 20 years in Nashville, and I'm getting ready to go back get it. And I was going to ask about that very thing, but is that? I guess that's a part two. Let's do that as a part two. Yeah, could we bring you back sometime and talk about those types absolutely. of influences in the in the music industry? Yeah, yeah, I that'd, love be, that'd be. I love be, talking about absolutely. that. Absolutely. Awesome. I mean, yeah. this from the kid who couldn't talk on the phone. This is now my ministry. You know, that's I told the Lord for fifty years, I'm not going to be your poster boy. Yeah. I'm not going to be your poster boy. And then one day, I bowed the knee and I said, I'm your poster boy. <laughs> here, I am. here i am do you need me today tomorrow here i am i, mm -hmm. here I am that's so awesome. it took me 50 that's another thing too it took me 50 years to get to this point not just mentally and emotionally but spiritually you yeah. know to get over you know the harassment for all for the decades and to really understand that god does have a purpose for my life and i need to obey and I told him for decades, I'm not going to be your poster boy. And my wife can attest that because those are my exact words. And then one day I bowed my knee and I said, I'm your poster boy, whatever you need. <laughs> so I'm happy to talk about this any place, anywhere about the Lord. You know, my ministry, and it's not like online or anything. It's, it's up here <laughs> and in here. My ministry is called Who is Like the Lord? 
and it's not it's not a it's not a question and it's not a it's not a um it's a boast is what it is because mm -hmm. my name is Micah L Micah L means mm -hmm. who is like the Lord it's a yep. boast there's no one like the Lord that's why I say there's no war between Satan and God there's, that's not a war right it's not a war you, you got a sun and you got a candle you know the sun and a candle you want to call that a war sure <laughs> you know right yeah there's no competition there there is uh, none. There is none. So the books are Devil Take the Hindmost, part one and two. Yes. And then uh, you also have, I think, a new book coming out, Nephilim Speak. Is that right? Uh, ne yeah, Nephilim Speak, Once once Fallen, Forever Damned. Mm -hmm. And that's got some really interesting uh, things in it that I don't hear a lot of people talk about. In fact, I just went on Derek Gilbert's show and talked about some of those things, you know, nice. last week. Which like cool. the mother of the Nephilim, for example. The mother, mothers of the Nephilim. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And we went into a bit, a bit of it. Didn't, didn't, didn't get a whole lot into it, you know, because <laughs> you know you don't want to give away, give sure. away the stuff. But uh, sure. you know, it's it's fun, it's fun. And I just put out a book. It's out now. It's called um, "Being a Kid Is Good Work" if you can get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> those are the, you know, I had to lighten up after those two books. Sure. And, and I said, you know what? I had a lot of funny experiences in my life and I'm going to record them. So uh, I recorded a lot of funny, a lot of funny things that happened in my life that were just belly buster laughs as a kid. And uh, I always used to say, you know, being a kid is good work if you can get it, you know, because <laughs> when you get old, you're out of work. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the truth. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you're unemployed when you get old, when you become an adult. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um. Well, uh, we, uh, dude, Michael, you've been great. You've given us well over two hours of uh, an amazing and beautiful and profound interview. And uh, thank you. Really, pleasure. really enjoy it. Uh, pleasure. Commend you on your courage. Yeah. Thank you. And um, thank you. we'd love to have you back. Um, I'd love to be back. You know, I, I have, uh, it's so funny how God works. I just recently, the past uh, weekend, have reconnected with, uh, this girl who I haven't spoken to in a few years. And um, she's a uh, Italian descent, grew up in uh, Long Island and mm. um, had uh, had parents who and she's like one of these like 160 IQ model, you know, so you guys architect. Very well. Yeah, we have nothing in common. <laughs> you know why she bothers with me. I have no idea. Um, but uh, but she has always had a really hard time with her parents uh and how they treat her no validation no affection mm. kind of yeah. some uh social abandonment you know just they just told her oh yeah just you know whatever just go out there and you're smart go out there and get a degree and you know have your career you know and and never really protected her or cared for her or and when i was listening to your story today i thought mm. all right god this is hilarious here's here's a guy you know here's another person of italian descent who you know grew up in you know a very northern environment but still uh and who has wrestled with these same you know things obviously your story is very different from hers but there are some similarities as far as the emotional psychological impact that how sure, your parents yeah. treat you have had on your life and uh and i like this girl a lot and i care about her and i want to make sure that i sort of provide for her what she needs what is it that like for people like you and maybe her who have gone through stuff like that, especially with their parents and feeling, you know, invalidated, exposed, abandoned and not loved or taken care of. What yeah. can people provide for people like that? I would say the number one thing, because I used to over I was an overachiever. I won every academic award. I was the captain of every soccer team, badminton team, volleyball team. I won everything there was to win for nobody mm. that yeah. the, the thing is you want to know that you have value and yeah. that's where Satan gets us is is and you know value is a it's a large spectrum it comes from someone caring for you it comes from validating your ideas it comes from right. somebody you know lifting you encouraging you up that you can do something you know it's it's a wide spectrum yeah. But uh, yeah, it, it, all of them point to one thing, and that's having value. Because when you've been devalued, and parents can do that without even without even knowing, 
Absolutely. You become devalued as a child, you become a devalued adult. And yeah. that, that's car crash stuff, emotionally, yeah. mentally, and physically, you know? Yeah. And the only yeah. way to, to help to, to, you know, to fill the void in somebody like that is, is to, you know, uh, is to give them value, you know, yeah. by a not, there's a number of ways to give value to somebody, but, you know, compassion and that you matter and what you say matters, mm -hmm. you know, and people come to you for your, your, your advice, you know, and they're compassionate about compassionate about you you know that that they do care yeah. they do care about the little things hmm. you, you know i mean we yeah. all care about each other when we're in the hospital right right but that's right. not a little thing no it's the day-to-day -day. Right, yeah. right right you know but you know if i'm you know need to pass a test or something like that you know i mean how how can you be in, encouraging in that way you know because it matters to that person i think really what it is 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 if it matters to me, how come it doesn't matter to you? That that's kind of right. how us voided people look at things. And why yeah. does that? Why does this matter to you, but this doesn't matter to you? Right. It, it's it's kind of like that because we don't have a perspective. All we know is that we don't have value, and yeah. I still struggle with that today. I still struggle with that today. And I'm an over an achiever at 56 years old. I'm an overachiever right. still. Whatever I do, I do to as par excellence as I possibly can, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, if I'm not, if I don't do it like that, then I, I feel it didn't go well. It didn't right. go well. And that's what your wife has given to you, has helped you have yeah, value. She, she has been more of the, the balance, hmm. keeping everything in balance, not yeah. there telling me I've done everything great. and Because I don't need to hear that. I don't need to hear that. Right. Keeping things in balance. You know, because balance is the only way to go through life. You have to be That's balanced right. mentally, physically, yeah. your diet. Everything has to have a balance to it. So that's yeah. kind of how I lived my life once I knew what was wrong with me. You know, after I you know got antidepressants and stuff is to be balanced and to look at everything. There's a balanced response for every answer. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, yeah. you know, for somebody who doesn't, who who's feeling, you know, has a hard time being validated don't don't overstep the encouragement and don't understep it you know what i mean have a right. balance yeah yeah you're great at this but you're not so good at this <laughs> <laughs> you know i think we just want to be not lied to yeah. you know yeah. because i have the biggest problem with lies one of the whole things i sought out christianity after i became christian was i wanted to know the truth so i yeah. went to you know theology school and studied under Henry Morris and stuff like that. I wanted to know the truth because I've been mm -hmm. lied to all this time, you know, yeah. and we should all be like that. We should all be wanting to know the truth. That's right. Because Speak the our truth. world is more lies than truth. It is. Of course it is. But it only takes Absolutely. one. I was talking to that girl about that a couple of days ago. It only takes, because we were talking about like speaking out against the stuff that's been going on the past few years, you know, and uh, yeah. and how you can get persecuted and disconnected from your friend groups or even your family over it. And I told her, it's like it only takes one stone of truth to dismantle of an empire of deception and lies. That's right. You know, that's, that's right. all it takes. So. Yeah, that's why you always have to look for the truth because there. Yeah. And you know that truth has a name, and it's Jesus. Yeah, it's Jesus. Jesus right. I am the truth, the life, and the way. So That's when you right. talk about the truth, you're talking about Jesus. Talk about him. So somebody yeah. says, I want to know the truth. And they said, well, do you know Jesus? Because if you yeah. don't know Jesus, you don't got the truth. <laughs> That's <Jesus> right. <laughs> Everything That's right. adds up with Jesus. Yeah. There, are, there are no, there are no um, fractions <laughs> when it comes to <laughs> there's Jesus. There's no remainder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's no remainder. You know, it all works out in the end. It's a math That's right. problem. <laughs> <laughs> well michael uh this has been amazing the last thing we will ask you is uh our motto on the goslings is uh take up the broken sword of your father and strike down the darkness um yes. do you have any words of wisdom for our audience uh so that they can go forth and strike down the darkness yes a guy told me this about six months ago a guy said he came up to me I didn't know the guy, but he said, he goes, I got to tell you something. And I've been praying, asking the Lord to show me something. And this guy came up to me out of nowhere, never knew the guy, never met the guy. And he said, he said, you know, he knew my name. He goes, Michael, he says, I make a lot of money. 
I make a lot of money. He said, I'm on TV. I do a lot of commercials. I got a lot of headaches in my life. A lot. I have a thriving business. It's full of headaches. And he says, you know what the best advice on the planet is? And I said, lay it on me, brother. And he said, just worship. Wow, that's awesome. And I said, bro, everything melts away when you just worship. And I said, you are exactly right. You know, sometimes you don't even have to pray about a situation. You just worship. Yeah. It's the kind of thing where nothing, you can never go wrong by just hmm. worship. That's what we were made for. That's right. We were yeah. made to worship. That's exactly That's right. That's the bottom line. We weren't made to pray and ask for things. We were made to worship. Hmm. So this that, is that would right. be my advice to anybody. <laughs> just worship the Lord. That's awesome. Amen, brother. I like Somebody that. better preach up in here. <laughs> this is always my favorite part of the interview for that very reason. So, yeah. Michael Galliari, thank you so much, my friend. Did I pronounce your last name right? Because if I didn't, Adriana is going to be really mad at Galliardi. me. So. Galliardi. 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 I'm, I'm never going to get it right. So <laughs> silent D, roll the R. Galliardi. 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 Yeah, I'm not gonna try. I'm gonna I tried and failed at the beginning of the interview. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's awesome. Michael, thank you so thank much you again, guys. my Michael, friend. You bet. Michael. You have been thank great. You thank you for having Let's me. Let's do this again and we'll talk about music. God bless you. God brother. bless. God, God bless. bless. See you later. Peace See and blessings. Bye bye. Hey, if you guys have been enjoying this interview and you'd like to hear the rest of it, including some really down and dirty stuff that we're not allowed to say here on YouTube, uh, head over to patreon.com forward slash the goslings. We'd love to have your support there and share exclusive content with you. That's right. Keep it cool. And remember, these are interviews that strike down the dark. They do indeed strike down That's the right. darkness. They strike down all the darkness. That's right. Strike it down hard. So hard. So hard. It's you rolling with my chaos. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness we're just laughing about how like that outro does not get old for us <laughs> it gets old in a way but i laugh at how ridiculous i am in it every time well i think it's adorable because it's nick rolling with my chaos you know? <laughs> i and thought it was well the chaos was mutual bouncing me. back and try. he didn't know i was gonna do that so you know you recovered nicely uh, anyways, I appreciate it. We really enjoyed our time with Michael Anthony Galliardi. Galliardi. Yeah. Now that we've figured out how to say it, we can't stop saying it. Yes. It's uh, fun to say once you get it. Yeah. And uh, we would like to have him back to talk about uh, his music. And uh, we'd love to. Uh, Gabe. Uh, Gabriel Bello Music has been in the chat. He has an amazing channel. He is a dear friend of ours and an excellent musician with a fantastic testimony. Check out his channel. Check out his music. Yeah. Uh, he's had us on. We've had him on. Uh, he is brilliant, and he's a dear friend of ours. And I would love to have Gabe and Michael get together. Oh, that yeah, would be cool. That'd be cool. You know, so if Gabe's down for it, if Gabe's down for that, yeah, we can talk later. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, you talk amongst yourselves. You know. Um, yeah. Now we get to pimp our books. <laughs> Never, yo, yo, referred to it quite like that. Yo, you want some books? Yo, hey, slow. Oh, goodness. Oh you want goodness. some books? You want to talk about? You want to talk about angels? Yeah. Why don't you come over here? Let's look. Let's, I got let's paperback. Let's do yours first. Sure. Let's dig, <laughs> dig me out of this hole before I say go, something go. naughty. <laughs> <laughs> so Nick and I are authors. Uh, it's how this channel surprise. Got started. Yeah, surprise. <laughs> uh, that's how this whole channel got started. Was we love to talk about writing and uh, our books and other people's books, and uh, we are still authors. Uh, even though we don't talk about it a whole lot during the interviews or during our Illuminati stuff. So we take this opportunity to tell you about our books. I Indeed. wrote a seven novel series on the wars between the angels called Heavenly Realms by Jonathan Goss. You can scan the QR code that's on your screen right now, or you can go to Amazon, type in Heavenly Realms Jonathan Goss, and you will find my books. They're available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook, and they're narrated by Adam Pearl, who's a dear friend of ours. Highly recommend if you have not checked out the audiobooks to check them out. Adam does an amazing job and he does all these different accents. He sounds like Alan Rickman. Yeah, he's um, good. And his father so was good. an Anglican priest who was tapped to be on the exorcism, exorcism team. team yep. Yeah, Adam's a super cool guy. And uh, we always want to try and encourage people to support him 
in his endeavor. But <clears throat> anyways, the first book is on your screen now. It's called Heavenly Realms Empyrean Falling, and uh, it's 18 bucks on Amazon. It's, uh, it's great. It talks about the war in heaven, the rebellion of Lucifer, and uh, his transformation into Satan. Michael the Archangel is kind of the protagonist. Um, normally, I read from that book a uh, sample, but I actually am going to read from this book. This is the ugly duckling of the uh, Heavenly Realms gaggle. This is called Triptych Codex. Triptych Codex. Heavenly Realms Triptych Codex. This is a series of three war journals written by the angels uh, during the first war that is described in Empyrean Falling. So this is actually a parallel. This takes place at the same time as the third portion of Empyrean Falling. I actually finished this before I finished Empyrean Falling. The, there were so many characters and so many events going on that I had a hard time of keeping track of where everything was. So I wrote three journals, uh, two from uh, Faithful Angels and one from a Fallen Angel. Uh, to represent the, you know, one-third fallen, two-thirds faithful Smart. thing. And uh, thank you. And it really helped me keep track of where everybody was, what battles were happening where, so that when I went back to write this book, Empyrean Falling, I knew what characters I could and could not include in certain things. It was so big that I kind of had to do that to keep track. So it actually was never really technically meant for publication, but I ended up doing it anyways. And uh, I've incorporated a bunch of my concept art in here that I have drawn. It's all terrible, um, but it is <laughs> it is there for uh, readers to sort of see what uh, these characters and, and classes of angels. and It's a war things. journal of the characters, but it's also your journal in the creation of the yeah, storyline. In a lot of ways. And uh, Very it, does, cool. it does give uh, a lot of insight into, you know, sort of painting the picture for uh, what, um, what the first book is about. So anyways, uh, I'll read you a, a quick excerpt, excerpt from this. Uh, this book is dedicated to Mike, uh, Mike Heil, who was oh, yeah. uh, dad's best friend yep. uh, before he passed. And then Mike uh, lives in Ohio with his wife, and he's a good friend of the family. He's a dear friend of mine. And uh, he was my boss when I was writing these journals when I worked uh, at the golf course. So, And he really just kind of let me do my thing. So these books, in a way, would not exist without Mike Heil. Oh, that's awesome. So I'll read you uh, the very first entry. It's from the Journal of Lantheron. Lantheron is a faithful cherub who is a character in Empyrean Falling, <clears throat> and he wrote his own journal. Um, right and go here we it. go. Um, day one, Zion. The unthinkable has occurred. The dark prophecy of the dragon has been fulfilled. We all knew it would happen, and we've been training perpetually for that day. It's just none of us thought it would come so soon. What's worse is the identity of the one who has fulfilled it. We always knew it would be someone powerful, someone who could wage war on God. We just never thought it would be Lucifer. The morning star, the right hand of God, the anointed cherub, has betrayed us and done the unthinkable. He has sparked the vile insurrection that will change heaven forever. One third of us have gone with him to fight under the dragon's banner, and they are, to make matters worse, most of the more powerful angels will have our hands full we certainly had a hard time dealing with them at the benediction not only were they more powerful than us but they had the element of surprise working for them when lucifer raised his sword hadroniel and challenged god we were not only taken aback by their treachery but also by their ferocity they fought hard enough to hold all of us back even my archangel patriarch michael was defeated by Lucifer. The only thing that saved us was the power of God blasting the morning star with holy energy after he had proclaimed himself Satan. And that was in his temple. Fear drives us now. Michael calls this a sin against faith. We're gathering our armies together, forming ranks and preparing for open war. War in heaven. All of us dread it. But we are ready. My maniple has been mustered just now, and so I pause to write before we move out. Already I can see our general, Gilgamesh the Great, gathering his shield and mighty warhammer, extolling his captains to hasten, lest we fail to prove ourselves worthy of our call sign, the Lightning Legion. We're leaving Zion via the North Gate. We're going to travel north to the stone city of Lordanar and fortify it. 
Word has it that Lucifer, renamed Satan, is going to try and take the Stone City. If he does, then he will have a foothold on the Northern Plains, and we and will be that much closer to Zion. We cannot allow this. So in an hour, our interdictor Lightning Legion, nicknamed the Thunderbolts, will depart. Numbering at a swift thousand, will arrive a mere handful of days before Satan attacks. No word yet on the number of forces he's committing, but I'm sure it will be a substantial amount. I only hope we are enough to repel him. Hmm. You got a scan. Somebody oh, scanned nice. it. Yep. Awesome. Yep. Thank you. Very cool. Uh, Gabe says, uh, bros, you need a website so you can have all your book collections ready to go. Uh, I do. Yeah. Amazon.com. Search Nick Goss. Find my books there. Yeah. And um, But I do want to have like a website where it'd be like special editions, mm -hmm. you know, send extra goodies to people. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, you know, special promotional things i think that is a good idea actually we're working so on something acknowledge like Gabe's that. idea. yeah gabe uh, and gabe is always great uh, full of great ideas we are working on something like that with mike fisher um it's just a matter we haven't really talked about it a whole lot yet because we haven't had time to really build it yet uh, but if you build it it will come that's right so we that is something that we have in the works um uh kina maynard asks do you sell them as a set so um six of the seven novels are published on amazon you can get them all there uh in any format you want the seventh one i just have to edit it and get a cover it's already done they've been done for like 15 years now um uh, let's see but also um on our patreon Kina, I think you might be a patron. I'm trying to remember. Yeah. But on our Patreon, I do have a bundle. It's like $300, and it comes with all of my books that are published, plus some swag, you know, bookmarks, trinkets. I only have a very limited number of these, by the way. And it also comes with some signed Stephen Pressfield. Yeah, signed copies so of Stephen it's, Pressfield. So it's a little expensive at like 300 bucks, but you get there. I sign all of my books personalized to you. You get like stickers and magnets and bookmarks. Uh, bookmarks actually that Adam's wife made for me that are really cool resin bookmarks. And then um, and then also uh, just about every Stephen Pressfield book that I have that's signed. It's there's a post somewhere in there uh, on the Patreon. Again, a good reason to check out the Patreon if you're yep. not a member yet. But uh, yeah, and I did that back in like April or May or something that so yeah there is a version that's like that out there but um but if you're interested i can always send you um personalized copies just email us at the goslingsgroup.com if you want personalized books from me or nick and you know we can work out all the details after yep that, so. absolutely contact Anyways. us through patreon yeah uh, i see ice queen in the chat huh good evening ice good queen. to see your name What's again up? good to see your name it's again good to see awesome you. good to yeah. see you uh, I am not going to plug Henry Half Moon or the timepiece. I've talked about those enough. However, I do have a book that I just finished writing. It's in the final post-production stages. We have an official launch date of, uh, well, at the latest, October 31st. Nice. Uh, it is called Unplugging Babel, yeah. a manifesto against AI, smart technology, and social media. It is a Bible-based screed <laughs> against what technology has become and what it's doing yeah. to modern Christians and how you can escape the beast system. Uh, it is gutsy. It's short and it is um, encouraging and hopeful, uh, but it's a bit fiery. I think you guys will really like it. Yeah. Uh, it's super Here, I'll just give you a quick little peek here. Look yeah. at this. Check it out. It's a proof copy. Unplugging Babel coming soon. There will be. Uh, there's some. Oh. No, I don't want to open it yet because okay. it's the okay. formatting is not quite done. But uh, sorry, I'm so excited about there the is cover. there is uh, there's going to be like a um, I am going to have a special edition uh, that I say special edition signed copies with some extra goodies and stuff that I'm going to make available just to the patrons first. Nice. Uh, so they can get like a special version of it. Yeah. And then, uh, and then, you know, it'll it'll be live to everyone else normally through Amazon, but you'll be able to get signed copies. But I'm really super excited about this. I will read uh, some excerpts uh, next time we do this. Awesome. I believe next week is our after party, right? Illuminati after party, Illuminati Heck after yeah. party. Heck yeah. <laughs> but it's going to be fantastic. My uh, wife proofread this. 
This is her favorite thing that I've written. She loved it. She couldn't wait to share it with her friends as well. Yeah. And uh, it will not be available in ebook, obviously, because <laughs> I'm not a hypocrite. Nice. Uh, but it is good. It's a short little paperback. It's great. Quick, easy read. It'll fire you up. You guys yeah. will love it. Yeah, yeah, it's really good. I poured my heart and soul into this uh, during the Linton season. Yeah. And now finally we are there. We've rounded third base. We're going to come screaming into home <laughs> to win the game against the Beast. That's right, baby. Yeah. Touching down. Yeah. Bam. <laughs> we'll do another high five because I, I guess it. Nick yeah, you guess that high five. Yeah. Yeah, it's so good. <laughs> this is so good. I'm so excited about this. A um, good reason, by the way, to observe Lent. What's that? Well, because you kind of really dug into that as an idea during the lentil, the lentil season. Yeah, the yeah. Lentil season. Hey, the lentil season. <laughs> the lentil season. The lentil season. Oh boy, is that is that during the forty days and forty nights? Or is that the seven, the seven long six days and crazy nights thing? From, <laughs> how many candles? Do God I was need? God was doing something in me during Lent, yeah. and uh, I was journaling that that process. And uh, Easter rolled around. We had our interview with Steve, and that was also inspirational. Uh, but just a lot of prayer and reflection. And I realized that I needed to get this. I needed to get these things, these thoughts, this conviction down and organized. Yes. And get it out there because mm-hmm. I think there. I think there's some people out there that really, really need to hear this. Absolutely. You know. Yeah. And so. it's going to be a great book for churches because it's small. It's not. Uh, it's not over long, and so it'll be very affordable for people to buy in bulk, you know. And I don't use naughty words, but people who read it are probably going to be saying some naughty words. They're going <laughs> to be, it's Provoke. going to be convicting. Provoke. I'll tell you that. You know, provocation is good. Provoke means to prod with a stick. Yep. And sometimes you have to be prodded with a stick and love. Yeah. You know, uh, Mike Fisher, by the way, had uh, mentioned, um, uh, reaching out to Angel Studios about our books, you know, whether it's uh, Henry Half Moon yeah. or the uh, uh, the Timepiece, you know, the Travelers League series of middle grade fiction that Nick writes, or my Heavenly Realm series. Listen, uh, a couple of you have, and we're super stoked about that. Yeah. And Thank if you. anybody wants to start a grassroots campaign to like start flooding Angel Studios, Carrie Solomon and, and all the people at Angel Studios with, uh, you know, uh, requests to make, you know, movies out of our our stuff dude we're, we'd be all about it if you grab mm-hmm. if you can grab his ear tell him i will take him to lunch and buy his taco bell you just <laughs> let me know when and where i'll supersize it <laughs> i will take him to a nice seafood dinner and definitely call him again i'll let him eat all the cheddar biscuits at the red lobster <laughs> the whole basket i mean not for nothing but like those are really good. They're amazing. Yeah, the uh, the white the trailer park. You know, the up jump white trash in me really loves <laughs> cheddar biscuits. And they used to make here's what a fat kid I am. They used to make a sourdough bowl that was like a fondue, that was like lobster and crab meat. Oh, yeah. Between that and the cheddar biscuits, that's like the only thing. Now Nick and I did get the crab legs, and because we'd always get the pincher and like pull the meat out of it and so find the good. articulation membrane and yeah, make the claw go. Yeah, make the Everyone go. does that. Yeah, that's yeah. fun. Yeah, I got a really funny story about my first defeat with my parents as a child. Okay. Involving Red Lobster, we'll have to talk about it on the Illuminati All right. After Party. All right. We don't have time tonight because we got to get sushi. Yeah, we got to get we got to get going. We have right, sushi. Right. We love you guys. We're so glad you stuck uh, stuck in there with us yeah. uh, for this amazing inter- interview with Michael and. Um, we will see you guys next week. We'll be here, Illuminati, Illuminati After Party. Yeah. Uh, BJ will be with us again for the yeah, Illuminati we'll After have Party. BJ back. How cool uh, is that? It's going to be fun, man. Yeah. He's hilarious. And uh, if you want to check out uh, Michael's books, um, uh, Devil Take the Hindmost is uh, the, uh, the book series that he has on Amazon. You can find it there. You can find all of his other books on Amazon as well. And um, we really enjoyed our time with him. We'd love to talk to him about music. Yeah, be cool. yeah, we'd be happy to have him back. So, yeah, uh, yeah, we better run because uh, we don't want to make the people at Sushi Time mad by yeah. showing up at eight thirty. But, anyways, uh, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, thank you for hanging with us. Thank you for this amazing chat. As yeah, always, it's been great. We really appreciate all of you guys, and uh, we will be back, like Nick said, for an Illuminati after party. And in the meantime, I'm Jonathan. I'm Nick, and we are the Goslings. Go forth. And strike down the darkness. A vertical punch. Whoosh.
Hey, real quick, guys. Just w- <laughs> just want to say thank you to Chris Caps yeah, for the thanks, super chat. Chris. You're awesome, dude. Thank you. Wanted to give you that shout out. You're, we appreciate you, brother. Thank you. Very thank much, you. All right. Good night, guys. All right.